reminds us before I retire, so thank you. Um, uh, by the way, thanks Richard for having me to this conference. This is my first time really uh, kind of have any interaction with uh, this wonderful group. And before I came, I was trying to figure out, you know, what do you guys do, you know? And uh, I was, um, I did some research. Bef before I came, I thought, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was born in a, in a house like this in China. This, was, this is my village. It's not real, it's a dramatized version, but uh, it's a... Uh, <laughs> This is the house I was born in. I just come back from China and visited my father. So I was thinking about how comparable, you know, what kind of profession, what can you guys do. The best I can come up with that's uh, in my village would be a fortune teller. <laughs> you know, what fortune tellers do, they, they take a look what you have, they try to make a guess what you can be, and you advise them to avoid all the devils on the road, right? That's, that's what you guys do. It's, uh, isn't that kind of your job anyway, right? You just tell them, take this path, not that path, right? Take this course, not that course. And I've learned, by the way, never call you guys guidance counselors. <laughs> I'm not from Switzerland, okay? I'm here. So, uh, so that was really cool. And I, I'm, this, another thing I actually was re doing research on, I realized you guys are actually the most important group of people in schools, and uh, which is true. I was, uh, I was looking somewhere, uh, do you know how Google writes about you? And that Google, I mean Wikipedia, the most authoritative source of information. <laughs> so this is what they wrote about you. I think you guys should uh, go edit it. It's a school counselor is a counselor and an educator. How cool is that, right? You counsel and you educate, you know, but you don't teach. No, who needs teachers, right? You just counsel, <laughs> you know. You're educators, you know. So, so today, I'm, I'm really seriously happy about this because I've been writing a lot about this. I've been looking for a profession that actually can deliver the kind of education I want, and I found you guys. So I'm going to join you sometime. That's, uh, and uh, so I want to start by asking us to think about education. Because one of the things I describe, I don't like the Google thing, I mean Wikipedia, they write about, you're about college readiness. Remember that thing? I really don't like college readiness. I don't want to be ready for college at all. It's, uh, uh, well, there, there are many reasons. I have, uh, I have kids, I have uh, two children, and uh, both now, now, I know, are in college, spending a lot of my money. Uh, <laughs> My son was, uh, has graduated already, and he was very ready for college and cost a lot of money. He was, uh, you know, he was at the uh, University of Chicago. You know how expensive that is, right? He was, uh, he was really ready and uh, went there, and, but he, did not, he was not so ready. He never got any money for it, so I got to pay for it. It was a horrible place, right? So good, but not so good, okay. And so he was uh, going to study Economics, that's uh, most Chinese will choose that major, okay. Anything makes money, that's the Chinese kids, you know. Uh, I'm sure you'll run into some of those people, right? It's, uh, they come there, I want to go to study either business, economics, or banking, accounting. That's all medicine, maybe. Right? So he was there, he was trying to go there, and uh, he was going to study economics, and the University of Chicago is perhaps the best place to study that. But after two years, he said, uh, you know, Dad, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I said, why? He said, there are too many Chinese in <laughs> economics, which is true. I said, uh, what are you going to do? Well, tell me really why. He said, well, I'm not very good at math. Not as good as other Asians in, in, the, in the program. And uh, I said, what are you going to do now? He said, I'm going to study uh, art history. <laughs> and I said, sure, why not? You know, why not? You know, art, we don't, you know, for the 5,000 years of the Zhao family history in China, we don't even know what art is. Go for it. It's a, it's a, <laughs> but, but, you have to promise me you cannot come back to live in my basement. <laughs> that's my, that's my definition called out of your parents' basement readiness. <laughs> it's, it's not about, uh, that's what education is about. 
A good education keeps other people's children out of their basement. <laughs> That's why I moved to Oregon from Michigan. Oregon has no basement in Eugene. It's, uh, it's good planning. There are many ways to do that. But if we take that seriously, okay, and uh, by the way, he is happy in the basement. He graduated three years ago. He's been working at the arts club in Chicago. And he just, uh, you know, going to, he's going to Stanford to go back to college again to get a PhD in art history. And he's happy. It's pretty good, you know. I'm really happy that uh, he did it. And my daughter now is studying philosophy and literature at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, it's, uh, so you want to, want, like people you want to ask, people kept, uh, my, my, I have a lot of Chinese friends. So what can she do with the philosophy major? <laughs> I say, well, that's why I'm not moving my house, because I'm staying in Eugene. You know, on the streets, how many of you, if you've been to Eugene, we got a lot of street corners for those guys, you know. My daughter has claimed 18th Street and, and order. <laughs> uh, she said, when I graduate, I can hang out there. That's a pretty good place. Okay. Out of basement readiness. Now, let's take a look at this then. College ready, you know, wh why do we have this kind of conversation about college readiness, about going to some places? Because we believe college leads to something, right? You know, out of basement ba readiness basically means you're financially independent, psychologically independent, and really socially independent. That's the burden of all school counselors have to carry. Make our kids financially independent, psychologically healthy, and socially healthy. So today I'm going to talk only about the financial piece. Why college readiness is not necessarily translating into out of basement readiness. And what we have to do about that. That's right. And if you look, think about out of basement readiness. When I travel around the globe, everywhere that we go, we run into the problem called youth unemployment. This is Australia, national crisis. The US, it's a national crisis. By the way, our unemployment rate is actually quite low. But too many of our college graduates are unemployed or underemployed. Underemployment is a more dangerous issue. Like our college graduates, a chemistry major, work at the Starbucks. We've given them a good title called baristas, but uh, <laughs> still you don't need that, OK? And you've seen a lot of them, Uber drivers. Do you guys know, notice that? Too many of our kids are underemployed. And that's why we have a best generation of educated bar best educated bartenders. Have you ever seen that? You go around, you ask kids, you know, what kind of degrees they have. The US, this is uh, the UK, this is China, this is uh, Korea, everybody. Youth unemployment is a serious problem. That's why we have a new name for this generation. You have Gen Y, Gen X. This is called a Gen B, Generation Boomerang, in the Boomerang Generation. You threw them away to college to come back to your basement. <laughs> you remember those things? They come back to you and carry a lot of debt. Remember those, those things? This is what's happening. So you want to say, why? This generation of our children are the best educated, truly, in terms of number of years of education, in terms of attainment in human history. But if you read any story today, we're talking about this generation of our children are not going to do nearly as well as the previous generation. What's wrong? Are they overly educated? No. They have been what I call miseducated. We've been educating them for something that does not exist anymore. By the way, in life, in, in, in life, in education, actually, in, we always talk about data. You know, data-driven education. You guys talk data-driven, data-driven. You know when sometimes data just don't work? Do you guys know about that, that idea? Some they just don't work. You know, we, we do this data thing, it's because we rely on past. We are relying on the past to predict the future. You know, like why do we call do college ready? Because college kids make more money. You know, do you look at the history, right? You know, always but when will this stop working? Do you guys know this? Well, let me give you a story about data. It's really cool. Uh, I told you I was, uh, I was born and raised in a Chinese village. Uh, and, and, uh, and by the way, the only reason I left that village 
was because I was so bad at the college's core curriculum, the common core in my village was driving the water buffalo. That's the common core. And of uh, SPAC or, you know, SPAC or park test of me was driving the water buffalo. I was so bad, you know. That's what my father said, just get out. <laughs> Don't mess with this stuff here. It's, uh, it was horrible. I was really a horrible farm boy. And I'm glad my father did not get me to remediation. You know, otherwise, I would have become the worst Chinese peasant, you know, it's a, it was a good thing, it was, it was very neat. So, so sometimes you just don't try to fix kids, okay. And so, <laughs> village, okay, my village. So when I was in the village, you know, I, I always think about data. And because I'm an educator, I'm an education psychologist, so I study data. And so this is, the following story is not real, but can be real, okay. So it can be, you know, it might be even better than real. So. Imagine on the farm, my father buys a chicken and feeds the chicken every day at seven o'clock. Now if you're the chicken, you'd be, you'd be, if you're a smart chicken, you'd be trying to collect data, right? To say, when do I get fed? Seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, you get data point one. You, you try that hypothesis. Yes, go seven o'clock, I get fed. Next day, I get fed at seven. You got two data points, right? If you keep running the whole thing, it actually works. All the time, say, man, who get relaxed. I got 365 data points now. I'm going to get fed by at seven o'clock by this guy until the Chinese New Year arrives. And my father decides to eat the chicken. <laughs> Sorry about that, you chicken lovers. But uh, and, and you go up there at seven o'clock in the morning, then you get killed. Whew, everything worked until it doesn't work. <laughs> Have you thought about the data? Have you thought? Of, so when we talk about something, we have to be mindful of the chicken story. And sometimes those things happen. It doesn't happen all the time. But sometimes that when the past stops working for the future, and that's where we call it a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift. So take a look in human history. How often does a paradigm shift happen? Not very in terms of education. So if you take a look at uh, this diagram, this is the changes of workforce over the last 200 years in developed countries. 1800, do you see the decline of the agriculture workforce. When you say sharp decline, that's called paradigm shift. That's when the chicken gets in trouble, okay? You saw, you saw the decline. And then you see the rise of the workers, the working class. That's what 1850, in the first industrial revolution happens. We abandon our land, we go work for somebody. That's where modern schools gets developed. We prepare you to work for somebody, for some jobs. But now you see the decline over there, about 1950s. You see, of the blue line, that's where we're getting in trouble right now. So let's take a look at this, this thing. So in order to prepare the working class, we had to devise an education. An education that produces employees for existing jobs. So right now, our education paradigm has always been trying to prepare employees for existing jobs. In order to prepare employees for existing jobs, what do we do? The first thing we do, we look at what kind of skills and knowledge you need. Remember, we go study them. We will study those, those, those things. So we look at, uh, okay, what kind of jobs, what kind of jobs are out there? We look at, okay, there are jobs like this. Then we extract from the existing jobs to set the knowledge and skills. You know, right now we always talk about what do they need? What do they need? We always do that. And then we call that the curriculum, the common core or uncommon core stuff, whatever it is, you know, just, uh, by the way, I've, uh, I've, I don't like the common core either. It's the stupidest thing you can happen to this country. It's, uh, it is, it's, uh, it's not because I don't like what's been right written inside. I mean, I, I would love it if it's not common or core. You know, 
just, it's core. The common core will be great if it's not common or core. But no, how do we describe this? How do you write this content? We look at them. We say, okay, you need the skills, you need this knowledge. When we describe that whole thing, then we try to teach that. This is our traditional education model. We prescribe the outcome, then we push everybody through the process. So you can acquire the skills and knowledge, and then you can be employed. This is the old model. We look at the jobs. But we know our children are different. You know, that's the trouble, that children are different. What do we have when, they, when our kids come to our school? They're like this. Our kids are so different. They're different in physical attributes. Some are taller, some are shorter. Some bigger, some smarter. Some have different, different colors and different hairstyles. That's the first source, okay, physical attributes. We're also different in terms of our intelligence. This is uh, not, not no news anymore. Our children are differently talented. What does different talent mean? It basically means you are born with different propensities for something. That is, some of you are born to be more likely to learn something faster and be greater in that area than in other areas. Okay, this is a very important story to think about. If you are born to be great, let's say, with the music, it simply means that you are more likely to learn music faster and become better in that domain, okay? If you're not as talented in that domain, it doesn't mean you cannot learn music. You can still learn. So don't get me wrong, we can still learn to do something, even if you are not. Like we can all learn to paint, but very few of us can truly become a Picasso. You see, you see what I mean? So here's interesting then. So everybody's talented in some domain, but we're not equally talented in all the areas. I'm not trying to say, you know, uh, you know we cannot learn. You can. But we're also differently motivated. We are different motivated. We, are, we, we pursue different things in life. We, are, we do not really get the same thing. You're born to have different passions. This is the source of passion. Can you imagine the whole thing? Like, for example, some of us are more motivated by power. We just want to boss other people around. <laughs> but not all of us. If you, have, you, know, you know, when you're as counselors, you know this. When you run some kids, if you have a group of five kids, one of them will want to be the boss, others are happy to oblige. This is, we have different profile, okay? We are different. And some people are very much curious. We used to think everybody's equally curious. That's not true. You know, if you have children, you know some of the kids are much more curious than others. They kept asking questions. Why do you want to do this? The other kids said, why do you ask the stupid question all the time? It's, uh, <laughs> right? We're not all equally curious. You've seen people who can be completely oblivious to whatever new things happen. And some others kept asking, so, well, did you notice that new thing? Curiosity. And some of us are much more into order, organization. Have you run into people in your life who absolutely get really angry with you if you put the pencil on the wrong side? <laughs> they color code everything. Then they color code the color codes. Have you seen those, those people? It's, uh, I, uh, you remember that, the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon? You know, you, you remember those? This actually, when we talk about this motivation, it, when you are born with this, Again, it does not mean you cannot be forced to do something else. You can be. It just drains your energy. If you get to do what you are passionate about, you gain energy from it. You know, that's why. By the way, I really hope you, you take this seriously, okay? This, 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 this theory of uh, it's actually from psychology at Ohio State University. If you look at, like, if you don't accept that we're different motivated, you really get in trouble. This, if you, re I hope you remember this. If you remember this, actually, well, helps enhances your domestic tranquility. You know, you don't argue with your spouses, you know, the other, you know, oh yeah, they are, they have different motivation. For example, you know, they are in Oregon. I'm a person who really don't get many things, okay. You know, in Oregon, Eugene, I live in Eugene, Oregon, you know, the birthplace of Nike. So one of the things I noticed that people kept running around. <laughs> we have a place called the Amazon Park, whatever it's that thing. I, I just drive by, they're running around all the time. I said, why do you guys running around? What, for what purpose? 
You know, in my village, we run for a purpose. You know, you run towards something good, run away from something bad. <laughs> Here in Eugene, we just kept running around, <laughs> wearing expensive shoes. And, and, and what's worse, you see these people riding bikes go up the hill. I tried to give them a ride. I said, no, you know. I said, so why did you go right up, high, up the hill? I said, well, what are you going to do in there? They just come back again. It's, that's called, those people enjoy something called physical activities. They get energy from those things. Okay. So just to bring this back, remember, this is actually not the only sources of variation, physical attributes, intelligences, motivation, then imagine something else, linguistic variation, social variation, then imagine something, cultural variation. All of the variations, we are very different. Think about it. You know, we traditionally we think about this one bell curve, you know. There are many bell curves in life. But many. So if you combine all of them, we even have a lot of love differences. But those differences are naturally occurring. They don't really mean anything until you apply them to tasks. For example, height. You know, if you want to play for the, the Broncos, height actually matters. That's the only thing I know about. I don't know what it does, but it's something called Bronco. <laughs> okay. All right. So don't, don't, okay. You guys must from Denver. Anyway, so it's a, a, the, height matters. So for me, for example, you know, I would not try to even try to, pr to play for the Broncos, right? I mean, look at me. Just the, uh, so the, the, but, but those attributes make you a great player for football will not be the same if you want to play ping pong. You see what I mean? Okay. So you now suddenly you have this difference. And then it's the same thing with, the, the same thing with the, let's say, uh, 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 intelligence. If you are born with something, and you can be great at that. Remember, any kind of innate or natural born talents needs to be triggered and needs to be developed. You also know no matter how, no matter how smart you are, you need time and effort to learn to become great. Remember those, the thing called 10,000 hours? Remember those things? 10,000 hours or 15,000, whatever. You need time to do it. Now let's apply the same 10,000 hours. If you apply 10,000 hours in an area you are interested in, you are born to have talent with, you actually can become great. If you apply 10,000 hours on something you have no interest, you are not born to have that talent in, what do you become? You become mediocre. You, you see what I mean? So for example, here's in, um, just take me as an example. I know I believe in this growth mindset. I'm a big believer. So, but I also know I'm smart enough to know that I can spend 10,000 hours learning to practice football, but I will have no hope to be financially independent playing football. Would you agree with me? So sometimes growth mindset can be a simple stupidity. Yeah, if you encourage people to do in this area, they really have no hope. Yes, they learn. Yes, they can do this thing. But remember how many 10,000 hours you have in life. You spend 10,000 hours on this, you won't have the same 10,000 hours on something else. I'm sorry. You know, it's, uh, you are counselors, but you cannot make more time for us. Now, let's take a look at this. We got these kids, but we want workers like this. So we design an education system to reduce the diversity into workers. That's our traditional education is. We don't like diversity. And this model worked actually very well. You know why? Because most of our traditional jobs were repetitive, mechanical, required basic levels of understanding. Basic levels of understanding. We don't need you to be great. Actually, in the olden times, there was really no need for anyone to be great. You know, if you take a job like this, I mean, Lady Gaga would be useless here. <laughs> would you think? Don't you think? So we don't need anybody great. So all the so-called great people were accidental. No education was designed to produce Henry Ford, 
Thomas Edison, remember those? No, they were accidental. So this was uh, the old model of education, like this, was in essence what I call a sausage-making process. It's a sausage maker. We turn all these great kind of meats into sausages. And then this is, we turn our children into machines. Our children were acquiring mechanical skills. And then something happened. Something happened. And what happened is this. This is why we are getting kids back. This job is replaced by machines. This is the shift. This is the call, the trigger. It's not the spring Chinese New Year to get the chicken killed. It is this change. And what do we call this change? We can call this the second machine age. The first machine age was steam engine. Massive, massive industrialization. Second machine age is smart technologies, computer chips. Or you can call this the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is happening now. We've gone through four industrial revolutions now. First, first steam engine, second electricity, third computer chips, fifth, fourth smart machines. Artificial intelligences, have you seen this happening all the time now? So now with this, we're seeing actually massive shifts of jobs. Our education was designed for a different time. Now I want you to rethink. Today, what are we going to do? This is uh, the human evolution. That's what's going to happen, you know. Think about this. <laughs> Technology will condition us, recondition us all the time. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at this, just for you to think about. You may not know what this is. This is something called a Google car. A car that does not need a human driver. It's coming to a street near you, okay? And it does not need a human driver. Can you imagine the kind of jobs that will be lost? Taxi drivers, bus drivers, all those things will be gone. Cops. By the way, uh, you know, those from Oregon, I want to caution you, uh, there are unmarked police cars who issue tickets. <laughs> I got a $435 ticket five weeks ago. I was simply following a great guy, you know, a car, and he turned unmarked police. I saw that's, bait, that's kind of baiting. He said, yeah, you took it, but that's fine, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, anyway, <clears throat> they will be gone. You don't need police officers on the road. Do you know why? Because there will be no bad drivers. No drunk driver. Drink as much as you want. You can just see, you know, nobody to arrest. If nobody to arrest, why would you need it? DMVs will be gone. Do you imagine those things? Traffic lights will be gone. A lot of jobs will be gone. This is what's happening seriously. And this action, by the way, explains the big shift in our economy. Since 19... This is actually really bad right now. You know, our political debate is surrounding this issue. Huge shifts, we call this the disappearance of the middle class since the 1970s. Because it, this is actually quite interesting. What happened here is a lot of those jobs required mechanical sc uh, skills are gone, taken over by machines, even Jeopardy. Remember Jeopardy? Now the machines can win Jeopardy now. And uh, uh, that's actually quite shocking. So this is interesting to watch how technology has changed our economy. So you see a lot of people become upper income, a lot of people become lower income. Those people, middle class, who can take advantage of the opportunities, earn more income, those who cannot shift it. This is what, actually right now, the debate. So now with the Google car, let's think about this. You can either lament on the fact that my job will be gone, or you can think about the opportunities the car might create. And so I want to invite us to think about opportunities. What kind of education we need in the age of smart machines? So can you imagine the Google car creating new possibilities for us? Have you thought about that? First of all, all of you guys can sleep an extra hour. 
You can take a shower, brush your teeth, take a bath on your way to school. <laughs> Have you thought about that? Okay, so if that's the case, what do we need? We need car interior designers. It's a new job. It's a new profession. You can put a hot top in the car. That was so nice. <laughs> uh, really, really. And another thing is that, you know, I am sure the consumption of alcohol will increase. So go buy some, uh, some kind of uh, vineyards and begin work in that domain. That might change, right? There are many things actually you can rethink about. Things can change. It's, uh, so look at opportunities. Technology took a lot of jobs away. And it will continue to do so. In the next 10, 15 years, perhaps we'll see another 40% of our jobs be gone. Existing jobs, they're really gone. It won't exist. So, but it creates new opportunities, like Google Car does. What kind of opportunities creates? Let's think this way. Technology, first of all, given all the technology we have, technology increases human productivity. Once it increases human productivity, it gives us more leisure time and more disposable income. That's what developed, you know, when we go to a developed country, the middle class began to have more time and more income. So you do not have to spend every hour and every dollar you earn on necessities. A hundred years ago, we worked, we, I am mean, not we didn't, our ancestors worked long hours and spent almost all their income securing necessities like food, shelter, and clothing. Today, I know you guys work hard, but still five days a week, most of us, eight hours a day, and we spend less in the U.S., on, like, fi less than 50% on necessities. So you have a lot more time, a lot more money. What do you do now? You spend them on something different, on something that's unnecessary. That's a beautiful bag, by the way, but you spend perhaps more than 300 bucks on that, right? <laughs> Does it, is it necessary? No, but it, it, it doesn't carry nearly as much as a plastic bag. It gets full, it's a, no. No, 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 don't, don't get me wrong. You think it's necessary, but it's not. It's a psychological consumption. That's why you buy phones every two years. You buy covers for your phones. We buy all this silly stuff, you know, and, but we want them. Today, we're in the age, I think Daniel Pink calls the age of abundance. Not as abundant as you wish, but still, we spend a lot of money on our psychological, spiritual, intellectual, aesthetic consumptions. We consume education, travel, tourism, food. Remember all those things? All of these are called psychological products. We consume desires, but desires are extremely personal. So that's why with the big thing we consume, we shifted from necessities to desires, and desires are very diverse, and diversity comes from this. We consume everything now. And every talent can be valuable. So then, the big thing we do today is choice. We consume choices. And as an example, 1992, I came from China, I came to Oregon, tried to buy something to wash my hair. Was not able to do it because I did not know what kind of hair I had. <laughs> Normal, oily, or dry. You got to know. You got to know. Do we need all these choices? No. No, no, no. But we want them. I had one bar of soap in China. That was fine. But no, here. We got it. Just look at this product. Almost all the talents, all human motivators, all different attributes become valuable here. To make these choices available, we need scientists. We need people who are good at talking to people to convince you, actually, this is better for your hair. We need dancers. We need the musicians. We need everybody to make this possible. So in a new age, is about uniqueness. 
about whether you are unique enough to create new products, new services that make people think they need it. You know, even now today, how many professions we have? We have personalized closet cleaners. It's a profession. Get on Craigslist, you'll find them. They can come to read your email for you. Organize your closet. That's so cool, right? It's, uh, you know, the, and they, they actually have everything called hyper-specialization. So in a new age, we've seen the undervalued motivation, undervalued talents, undervalued knowledge have become more valuable. We've seen the rise of the celebrities for nothings. We've seen the rise of the useless people. A lot of, a lot of useless people have become useful. Like, uh, like Kim Kardashian is a good example. <laughs> it's, it's right, you know, you, you, can you imagine how would have she been valuable in my village? <laughs> but now, she is sort of valuable. You may not like her, but she's not in her parents' basement. Right? In education. I'm not encouraging you to produce her, but you have to think hard about data. She's not in her parents' basement. What makes her valuable? She, actually, perhaps less than 1% of people like her even. And by the way, I actually met her once, really so good, so cool. <laughs> she didn't meet me, I just, it's a one direction met, meeting, you know. It was, <laughs> it's a, uh, we just, uh, we, we just coexisted in one elevator, that's it. It's, uh, that was in, that was actually was cool. It was in Australia, it was uh, it's many years ago, four or five years ago. I didn't know who she was, really. And uh, I was in the elevator in uh, Melbourne, actually near a casino. And uh, so I, I, some people came in and said, you know, can you get out? I said, why? He said, well, because Kim is here. I said, who is Kim? <laughs> uh, 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 I got out. I'm a, I'm a kind of compliant Chinese guy. I said, sure, I'll get out. Okay. And I went out. I saw all this food. There's people in the, in the lobby, young kids. I said, what are you guys doing? I said, we're waiting for Kim. I said, who is Kim? I said, Kadarshan. Okay. I said, well, yeah, okay, fine, Kadarshan. So I talked to my daughter, who is at that time, she was, I think, 14, 15. And I said, so who, who is this Kim Kadarshan? My daughter said, well, she's a celebrity. I said, celebrity for what? She said, well, celebrity for nothing. <laughs> nothing. She's famous. She's famous for being well known, you know. That's, that, that, that's, that's what, what she was about. Okay. So, but she creates value for somebody. Maybe one of a thousand people. So she's very much like a bottle of shampoo. She represents a choice. Represents a choice. If you look at that way, another thing was she was valuable because of globalization, because of technology. If she's like about one out of 10,000 people, but if she stayed in a village like Honey Boo Boo does, <laughs> Honey Boo Boo stays in a village of 700 people. Without modern technology, it would be no value. But she can reach 7 billion people. One out of 10,000 of 7 billion is a lot, so unique talent. So, so no matter what talent you have, you have to be great. Someone is there to appreciate that. So this changes our thinking about quality and talent. About education. Let's think about, uh, uh, let's see. How dyslexia becomes a talent. Have you, you've, I'm sure you, you guys study this kind of things all the time. The gift of dyslexia. Dyslexia is a condition that impacts negativity or reading. That's just as one of the consequences. I'm sure you're an expert on this domain, right? However, behind dyslexia hides the ability of dealing with graphics, images. So dyslexic individuals can be great artists. Now you run into the problem. Do you want to fix someone's dyslexia or you want to cultivate their artistic talents? Before, 100 years ago, you may have to fix dyslexia because reading was necessary for all the jobs you do, and art was not consumed widely by a lot of people. 100 years ago, only the wealthy, rich consumed art. But today, do you guys know, everybody consumes art. Everything has become art. Your hair, your back, your tie, the chair you do. Food has become art. That's why the more money you pay, the less food you get. 
It's an artistic experience. <laughs> you consume that. And that's why, so now, do, this is a challenge. Now today, don't fix them. Actually support them because number of artists in the U.S. has been on the rise. On the rise so much. It's a, what kind of on the rise is really serious stuff. Let me see, here we go. The increase of artists. This is the only data I got, 2001. We, I'm sure we're getting more artists over here. So now, you want to bring back all this together. Think about them. You want to fix somebody, you want to support somebody, okay? It's another person, you know, Michael Phelps, a great swimmer. I'm always think, fascinated about, by his stories that if he had tried to fix his literacy before he could go swim, he might still be hooked on phonics in some basement. <laughs> No, you want to get him off the phonics and go swim. It's a, you know. So now, to this lesson number one, to take advantages of the opportunities created by technology or to beat smart machines, we need to help our children become more human, not more mechanical. And be more human, one of the first things is called uniqueness. Trust that every child has something to offer as a unique human being, if Kim Kardashian is useful, anyone can be useful. <laughs> Number one thing, that's, that's why education, it's time to think about preparing our children as somebody else. It's not to meet the out prescribed expectation, it's to grow every individual. This is a big difference. It's not to impose on our children something we prescribed. We think you need this. No, you grow the child. That's why counselors, you guys are educators. Educators draw out of the children. Educators create opportunities for every talent. Our children are different. They come to our school. Do not look at what they cannot do and fix them. Start with what they have. The fortune teller experience, remember that? You grow them. This is what, we create opportunities for every talent. And we can do that. So that's the most important thing to think about is actually, as Todd Rose wrote a lot about, in the end of average. Our children do not succeed as an average profile of things. You know, we like to have this average profile. Or you need like uh, math, science, and reading. Or you need the four C's, critical thinking, creativity. But you know, actually, sometimes that's absurd. And we prescribe the, the profile. So let me ask you a question about profiling kids. And uh, the, so we have this then. For example, what makes a person successful? We may want to say, OK, we need uh, English language arts and math. That's the common core successful. Or somebody said, no, 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 we need uh, a math, social studies, science. Remember, that's what we think. We think you all have a little bit of those things. And then actually, you know, some people say maybe it's EQ or IQ. Remember those things? They actually, or sometimes, you know, like uh, you can think about something else. That's actually, according to my father, it's, uh, you add 23%, it should be feng shui anyway. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, so, so we have all this average cons profile concept. You don't do those things. Children can succeed with one area, never fix other areas. We, have, we are not good at something else, hire somebody else to do it for you. Okay? So now, that's the first thing to think about. How do you support individuals, individuals in their own domain to be great? But also beyond that, we need another kind of change, another shift of education, is think about our children as more have the entrepreneur mindset. Imagine there are no jobs. We create jobs. And the opportunities are right there. Our children can recreate all those jobs. And, but those jobs require different kind of capacity. So here it comes to what I meant by counting what counts. What matters in education in the future is called uniqueness and diversity. Social capital, what I call social intelligence. By the way, I never liked the term called collaboration. Collaboration is simple skills. You need to be socially smart to know when to collaborate and with whom to collaborate. You don't even need to learn. That's, you, you become one of those. So really think about you need a passion, you need a creativity, 
You need the entrepreneurial mindset. But all of this come back to say, so what kind of education do we need? Instead of this kind of education, we need to shift to a very different kind of education, not to suppress diversity, but to expand diversity. Not to prescribe outcome, but to support the growth of individuals. This is why, by the way, I've been writing a lot in my new book called Learners Without Borders. That's not coming out yet. We need to rethink about our children. Our education is to support individual growth rather than imposing upon everything on our students. So, to keep our children out of our basement, what can we do? Well, to start with, we have to think about a personalized education curriculum, education experience, not controlled by machines, but rather really, we pr children should be supported to build their own learning ecosystem. Second, shift our pedagogy to support children learn by doing, making meaningful things. As one final example, I'm keep looking at the clock. I, I know I'm, I gotta get out, but no. Here's an example to think about. There's a group of people working on something called uh, education corporations. There's a school in Georgia called, uh, I think the Elm Street School in Rome. First graders have been doing something called making sugar beauty scraps, okay? It's first grader. They make them, they mark them, they build them, they give to everybody, remember? And the students form like a corporation. You follow their passion to strength and do what they are good at doing. They work together and made about $17,000 a year. They sell to 50 states, nine countries, these kids. And then they've been invited to address the Georgia Assembly. And then the kids have been doing keynote speeches for the Georgia STEM. Some of you from Georgia may want to visit the school. First grade, what's changed them is their confidence. This actually is a very high poverty school. And these kids, get something that's valuable. They know they're good for something. If you kept fixing them, they will not develop the confidence to create a future for themselves. Our children do not walk into the future, they create their own future. I think to do that, we need all our counselors to work together. So I have great confidence in this profession. You are not a fortune tailor, you are fortune makers for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ajao. That was great. Uh, what a great message. Um, I, I was really anxious to hear him. I've heard him speak before, and, and I, I just completely agree with almost everything he says. <laughs> but, uh, but so you have, a, you have a, a, a big treat today. You have two Chinese guys on the stage here. <laughs> How often do you get that, right? <laughs> Well, it's been very exciting. Uh, don't forget Dr. Zhao will be signing copies of his book, Counting What Counts, Reframing Education Outcomes, near the ASCA booth, uh, the bookstore. So um, please go up and get a copy of his book. Meet him. I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. Um, don't forget to vote for uh, the ASCA Board of Directors and uh, go to the, the ASCA homepage. Um, if you haven't uh, bought tickets for the ramp dinner tonight, I think there's still some available. So please come down uh, upstairs to the eighth floor. We'll celebrate all of our ramp winners and have a great day. <laughs>